Hey friends, welcome back to my channel. My name is Jennifer Franchak and I'm a certified functional nutrition counselor and I work with motivated men and women who are struggling with chronic illness as well as those who want to prevent chronic illness from happening in the first place. And I teach them how to take control of their own wellness through personalized nutrition, self-care, and by creating mindset change. Welcome back to Move the Needle Monday. Today brings us to the end of our series on the three roots of chronic illness. We've talked about digestion, genes, and the last root of chronic illness that I want to talk to you about today is inflammation. When you think of inflammation, you may think of the type that you get when you have an infection or acute injury. So let's say you have a splinter in your finger and you're, you're most likely going to have pain and it, it's probably going to look red all around that splinter. It may be a little swollen and it may even be warm to the touch. And those are, those are the signs of inflammation. Those things that I mentioned, the, the pain, the swelling, um, the tenderness, and um, the, the warmth around, around that area and, and redness. And this is your body's way of trying to repair and heal that injury. So in that case, inflammation is actually a positive thing because it's doing its job. But the kind of inflammation that I'm going to be talking about today is chronic inflammation. And this can sometimes even be silent. So this means that you aren't always aware that it's happening because you may not be experiencing any obvious signs of inflammation. But inside your body, your immune system is responding. And I want to get more into the immune response in just a minute. But I just want to share a quote with you from the book Digestive Wellness by clinical nutritionist Dr. Elizabeth Lipsky. And she says the external manifestation of an immune system out of balance is inflammation. And I, I really like that quote because it just sums it up very nicely. And studies have shown that both environment and lifestyle promote chronic inflammation. A few other things that can drive chronic inflammation are intestinal permeability, which we've talked a lot about here, what you eat, your stress levels, chemical exposures, acute and chronic illnesses and infections, drinking too much, over-exercising or under-exercising, smoking, not getting enough sleep, and obesity. And these are all the things that increase your inflammation levels and cause the body to remain in a chronic state of inflammation. So I just want to give you an example of this and you, you'll be familiar with this. If you watch my other videos, I'm going to talk about leaky gut. And again, with leaky gut, the epithelial cells that line your small intestines are being separated because there are tight gap junctions that hold them together and they're being broken down by things like poor nutrition, chronic stress, certain medications, and pathogenic bacteria. And once these gaps between your epithelial cells, again, the cells that are aligning your small intestine, once they open up, uh, which is called leaky gut or intestinal permeability, foreign substances like undigested food particles and pathogenic bacteria, fungi, they can make their way into your bloodstream. And because they, they shouldn't be there, this triggers an immune response, which leads to inflammation. And last week I talked about lipopolysaccharides, which are a component of something called gram negative bacteria. And this type of bacteria reside in our intestines and are what we would consider to be the bad bacteria that can lead to inflammation and trigger the immune system and lead to disease processes starting especially when we have intestinal permeability. And those LPS bacteria escape through the intestinal barrier into your bloodstream and travel to different parts of the body, creating an inflammatory effect. So that inflammation is going to be continual until the lining of your small intestine is healed and those substances are no longer escaping into your bloodstream. And that example that I gave is just one avenue of chronic inflammation. So imagine if there are multiple avenues of inflammation happening in your body on a regular basis. So you have intestinal permeability. Um, you, maybe you eat a diet that's high in processed foods and added sugars, and you stay up too late most nights of the week and you don't end up getting enough sleep. And maybe you drink a little more on the weekends than you should. And all of these factors add up and kind of compound. And these are all pro-inflammatory behaviors. So the long-term effects of this are not good and they often contribute to pathogenesis or the development of chronic disease. So what are some of the diseases associated with chronic inflammation? Well, an article published in Frontiers in Immunology 
that was called The Regulation of Inflammation and Chronic Disease, and I have that linked to my resources. It states, growing evidence suggests a close link between inflammation and many chronic health conditions, including diabetes, metabolic syndrome, cardiovascular disease, cancer, rheumatoid arthritis, inflammatory bowel disease, asthma, and chronic obstructive lung disease. And the list goes on. So we know that chronic illnesses, which include autoimmune diseases and cancer, involve pre-existing and ongoing inflammation. Some of the symptoms of chronic inflammation are pain. So pain in different parts of your body, achiness, frequent headaches, getting sick frequently, fatigue, like being tired a lot and just feeling really run down, digestive problems like constipation and diarrhea and acid reflux, insomnia, gaining extra weight that you just can't lose. These are all signs and symptoms that can be indicative of chronic inflammation. So let's talk about the role of the immune system when it comes to chronic inflammation. I briefly mentioned before about acute versus chronic inflammation at the beginning of the video, but I want to go into just a little more detail on that. Inflammation is an immune response and acute inflammation is a very important and beneficial process when it comes to healing an injury or infection. So we, we need this process so that we can recover when we've had an injury. During the inflammatory response to something acute, remember that splinter that we talked about in your finger earlier? During this whole process, so if you have that splinter in your finger, chemicals are released into your bloodstream that will trigger your blood vessels to dilate or get wider. So that's the first thing that happens. And this is going to increase blood flow to the injured area, which is a good thing because it brings nutrients and oxygen and white blood cells to that injured area, which promotes healing. So also the triggering chemicals that I just mentioned, they work to make the capillaries that carry your blood more permeable. So they become a little leaky. Um, and this leakiness allows proteins from the bloodstream to cross over into circulation. And the proteins take water with them, which is what causes swelling in the inflamed area. So a lot of times when we have an injury or an infection, there's some kind of swelling. And this is what's happening under the surface. And swelling in this type of situation can actually be a good thing because it's, it's your body's natural way of protecting the, the injured area. And eventually, if everything works how it's supposed to, the injured area heals and everything goes back to normal. And again, that's, that's how the normal process of inflammation works. However, with chronic inflammation, this is where things kind of go off the rails. With chronic inflammation, the same acute immune response that I just mentioned happens, but in this case, it doesn't stop. So it continues day and night over a long period of time. And the chemical signaling continues to happen, which then brings in more and more white blood cells to clean up the perceived injury or assault to the body. And the white blood cells that are involved in an acute inflammation scenario are, are called neutrophils. And their job is to clean up the bacteria and debris. So they come in to do their job, but the chemical signaling molecules are continually telling, bringing more and more in, signaling for more and more neutrophils to come in. And when this happens and the inflammation becomes chronic, macrophages, plasma cells, and lymphocytes all begin to replace the neutrophils. And these are different types of white blood cells. And this is problematic because over time, these cells, primarily the macrophages, begin to cause cell tissue and even organ damage. So the immune response in this scenario becomes dysregulated, which results in all kinds of downstream problems and specifically chronic illnesses. Something else that I want to mention here is the involvement of free radicals or reactive oxygen species in this, in this whole process of inflammation. Now, in case you're not sure what I'm talking about, what reactive oxygen species are, I really like the National Cancer Institute's definition. Uh, they state that reactive oxygen species are a type of unstable molecule that contains oxygen and easily reacts with other molecules in a cell. A buildup of reactive oxygen species in cells may cause damage to DNA, RNA, and proteins and may cause cell death. Reactive oxygen species are free radicals. So damage to DNA, RNA, proteins, and cell death, those are not good outcomes. And this is where antioxidants come into the picture, which I'm sure you've heard of those too, because their job, their specific job is to hunt down and neutralize free radicals so they can't do any damage. So how are free radicals involved in chronic inflammation? 
Well, I just want to note here, first of all, that our bodies produce reactive oxygen species or free radicals, and research has shown that reactive oxygen species also serve as important signaling molecules in cell growth, division, and survival. So they can serve a purpose, but when we have an excess of these free radicals forming, that's an, and not enough antioxidants to neutralize them, that's when we run into problems. And this is called oxidative stress, when we have too many free radicals and not enough antioxidants to neutralize them. And chronic inflammation and oxidative stress usually go hand in hand. One begets the other and it becomes a cyclical process. So for instance, the macrophages that I mentioned earlier, which are the a type of white blood cell that replace the neutrophils in, in situations of chronic inflammation, they produce reactive oxygen species. So you have a dysregulated immune response that is creating an inflammatory cycle with the production of more free radicals. It's like this cycle of inflammation. And the key here is how can we intervene? What can we do to intervene in this cycle, to break the cycle, to minimize the inflammation? And there are many things that we can do. And I'm only going to touch the surface on the things that we can do. How can we move the needle of inflammation? What are this week's big takeaways? Well, I'm going to repeat myself with my first two suggestions. I've mentioned these suggestions over and over in my last few videos, but they are worth repeating and they definitely have a big effect on inflammation. So the first thing I will recommend is removing or cutting back on processed foods and added sugars. I know I say it a lot, but processed foods and added sugars are very inflammatory. And we've discussed this during the past few weeks. They can lead to intestinal permeability. They also feed the bad bacteria in your gut, which creates dysbiosis, which we just mentioned, which then leads to inflammation. So we want to keep that bad bacteria in check. And we want to start replacing those processed foods with, with whole foods. And um, also I recommend ditching the, the sugary drinks for water, herbal tea, coconut water, things of those nature. So this is a really important first step in, in stopping the cycle of inflammation is cutting back or removing highly processed foods from your diet. I would recommend removing, but you know, sometimes it's a process. It's not an overnight thing um, because highly processed foods can be very addictive. So it's hard to just do it cold turkey sometimes. But I think that this is a great and very important first step in breaking the inflammatory cycle. The second thing that I'm going to mention, and it probably won't be a surprise if you see my other videos, is to eat colorful fruits and vegetables in every meal. So colorful fruits and vegetables contain antioxidants, which will help to neutralize those reactive oxygen species that we talked about. And they also contain high amounts of polyphenols, which are very healing to the gut. We've talked about polyphenols too over the past few weeks, but polyphenols are compounds that are found in most fruits and vegetables. They are very healing to the gut. They are very anti-inflammatory in nature. So try to eat some fruits and vegetables, specifically vegetables. Fruit is fantastic too, don't get me wrong, but I think that we really tend to neglect vegetables, um, especially in this country because, you know, Americans have a sweet tooth. We wanna eat something sweet but vegetables are so important. They're just packed with so many nutrients. So I usually recommend to my clients, can, depending on you know their individual situation, I will recommend a lot of times to eat vegetables with every meal. And also try rotating your vegetable choices so that you're not eating the same ones over and over. And by rotating your vegetables and exposing your body to different types of vegetables, you're feeding the microbes in your gut and helping to diversify them and you're creating a healthy gut microbiome, which will help to reduce inflammation. So it's all tied together. Like I say a lot, um, everything is connected. And a lot of these recommendations that I give every week will help all of these things that we've talked about, digestion, promoting epigenetic changes and inflammation. These are all things that will help you. So another thing that I wanna to mention today that I really haven't talked about in the past in any of my past videos is to get plenty of healthy fats and to remove unhealthy fats. Now I'm going to say something that probably is going to blow your mind because it goes against a lot of conventional wisdom. Vegetable and seed oils, okay? These are soybean oil, corn oil, cottonseed oil, canola oil, rapeseed oil, sunflower oil, 
sesame oil, grapeseed oil, safflower oil, and rice bran oil. They are not, and I'm going to repeat this, they are not the healthy oils that we've been told they are. And they're actually, they're not made from vegetables. It's a misnomer. Vegetable oils belong to a category called polyunsaturated fats, or PUFAs for short, and they are extremely processed. Oil is not a natural byproduct of seeds, and so it has to be extracted using chemical solvents. And this includes something called hexane, which incidentally is a component in gasoline. So if that's not enough to kind of turn your stomach right now, keep listening. So I just wanna give you a brief overview of how vegetable oils are made. First, the seeds are cleaned and crushed, and then the oils are expelled. And then the oil needs to be filtered, refined, bleached, and deodorized to remove any smells and flavors. This process also strips away any natural antioxidants that were part of the original seed, which makes the oil more prone to oxidation, uh, which as we've learned is not a good thing. So fun fact, all fats, all natural fats, I should say, not trans fats, not fats that are created in a, in a lab or a factory, but natural fats go rancid or oxidize at certain temperatures. Unfortunately, polyunsaturated fatty acids oxidize at a much lower temperature, and part of the whole refining process includes high heat temperatures. And once oxidation happens, the free radicals, which we just talked about, form, and then they can go and attack molecules in our bodies, leading to cellular damage. And if you're interested in learning more about this process of, of how they make vegetable oils, there are many videos that you can watch on YouTube, which document the process. Um, you can watch videos even that the vegetable oil, oil industry puts out, and um, you can just see how, how for yourself how this is done. Now there are expeller pressed vegetable oils that you can buy like expel expeller pressed canola, which uses a different extraction method and avoids hexane. And this may seem like a healthier option, but it's really not. Vegetable oils are high in omega-6 fatty acids. And while our bodies need some omega-6 fatty acids, the average American is getting way more of these fatty acids than we need. And too many omega-6 fatty acids create a pro-inflammatory state. I want to share a quote with you from an article that I read in the magazine Today's Dietitian. And I think this gives you a good overview of the problem that we're seeing today, especially in the United States, of um, kind of our imbalance of omega-6 fatty acid consumption versus omega-3 fatty acid consumption. We're going to talk about omega-3s in just a minute. So the article in Today's Dietitian states, before the industrialization of food in the last century, scientists estimate that the ratio of omega-6 to omega-3 fats in the human diet averaged between 1 to 1 and 4 to 1.2. Substituting animal fats in the standard U.S. diet with vegetable oils in margarines and salad dressings and other processed foods has resulted in a drastic increase in omega-6 consumption. Polyunsaturated fat consumption rose from 13 to 37 grams per day within the last 100 years and now accounts for 21% of total fat intake, mostly in the form of omega-6 fats. As a consequence of these dietary changes, the current omega-6 to omega-3 ratio has reached an all-time high, estimated between 10 to 1 and 20 to 1.2. So we went from 1 to 1 of omega-6 versus omega-3s to, you know, between 1 to 1 and 4 to 1, basically, to what it is now, which is anywhere between 10 to 1. So 10 parts, you know, omega-6 to 1 part omega-3, even up to 20 parts omega-6 to 1 part omega-3. So the article continues to say the excess of omega-6 fats and the deficiency in omega-3 fats in the U.S. diet is thought to be associated with today's increased prevalence of chronic and inflammatory diseases. So there we have it, right? I think it's really good to look at this because we don't really talk about omega-3 to omega-6 fatty acid balancing. That's not something that you read about in a lot of health magazines or that something that's talked about, but it's so important. Um, I think a lot of Americans aren't eating fish and um, things that, that contain omega-3 fatty acids. So take a look what, at what you're eating on a regular basis. And if you're eating foods that contain vegetable oils or you're cooking with them, 
replace these with better quality cooking fats like extra virgin olive oil, which is fantastic, extra virgin coconut oil, grass-fed ghee, tallow and lard. And I mentioned tallow and lard. I know those are controversial, but um, they actually have a pretty decent nutrient profile, but they have to be from grass-fed animals. Anytime I mention um, any animal fats or animal proteins, I am recommending, you know, grass-fed, wild-caught. Those have better nutrient profiles than something that's been factory farmed or like a farmed raised fish. And I recommend really focusing on increasing your omega-3 fatty acid consumption because it is so important. It's so important for your brain. And we know that fatty acids in particular are very anti-inflammatory and they're found in foods like fish, particularly cold water fatty fish. So salmon, sardines, mackerel, those are some examples of cold water fatty fish. And omega-3s are also found in chia seeds, flax seeds, and walnuts. And even you can find some in grass-fed beef, although in a lesser amount, but make sure again that it's grass-fed because when you have animals that have been um, feeding, you know, grazing, getting sunshine, grazing and eating in grass, um, getting hay in the barn in the winter when they're being treated humanely, the nutrient profile of, their, of the food that they yield is so much better than, than factory farmed animals. I would also recommend eating wild caught fish two to three times per week if possible so uh, that you start to increase your omega-3 consumption. Also supplementing with the cod liver oil is a great way to get omega-3s into your body. Just make sure if you're going to get cod liver oil, make sure that you purchase the best quality possible. So I wouldn't recommend getting something that could oxidize easily like cod liver oil from your local drugstore or even from Amazon because you don't know how long it's been sitting on the shelf. You don't know if it's been subjected to any temperature changes in transit. It could have been, you know, coming transported from a really warm area or in the back of a truck. You just never know. And you don't want to get something that has gone rancid and then you're doing more damage than you are good. So I'll put a link under the resources for some brands that I recommend to my clients of cod liver oil, but that's another wonderful way to get omega-3s. But anytime you can get cold water fatty fish into your diet, I really recommend doing that because it's just so beneficial for your body. The final thing that I wanna to mention today is that you can periodically have your C-reactive protein tested. And C-reactive protein is a biomarker that is a strong indicator of inflammation in your body. And it's a really simple blood test. It's a great way to just get a glimpse of what's going on inside of your body. And if you're making dietary changes and lifestyle changes to try to lower inflammation, I think it's a great way to maybe as you're starting the process of making these changes, get a blood test done, get your C-reactive protein tested, see what the number is, and then wait maybe three to six months. And after you've implemented these changes, get it tested again and see if it's changed. See if, see if the things that you're doing are helping to lower your inflammation. Um, I think this is a really good way, other than also seeing how you feel. That's another great indicator of whether or not what you're doing is working. If you're experiencing less symptoms, less pain, you have more energy, those are all great ways too. But C-reactive protein is a good way to just kind of get a quantitative um, measure of what's happening with regards to inflammation in your body. So you can ask your doctor to do this test or you can go through an independent lab. I'm going to also put a link in the resources for a lab that I use in case you want to check out your CRP levels. A lot of times they have discounts on individual labs. If that's something that interests you, check that link out. Of course, there are so many other things that we can address when it comes to inflammation that I didn't even get to today, including stress and sleep and environmental triggers. But if I try to cover all of those things, this video will be several hours long. So I just want you to know that all of those things matter when it comes to inflammation and the management and prevention of chronic illness. Food, consistent sleep, stress, environmental triggers, genes, microbiome, digestion. And as we've talked about over the past few weeks, these are all factors that we can influence 
through our behavior and our lifestyles, right? Through our nutrition, we can change, we can influence these factors. I hope that you've enjoyed this three-part series on the roots of chronic illness and that this video gave you a really good overview of inflammation and how it factors in as a root of chronic illness. If you have any questions about this, please leave a comment and reach out and let me know. And if this video was helpful for you, please like and subscribe and share it with a friend or family member. Also, if there's a topic that you'd like to know more about in a future episode, reach out and let me know. I'd love to hear your suggestions. You can contact me through my website and social media. I'm on Facebook and Instagram. Thank you so much for taking the time to watch this video and have a great week. I'll see you next time for more Move the Needle Mondays.